Hi, I'm Symphoniers, and Mark Rosewater just put out a blog article about Nadu. I think it's actually one of the most interesting and insightful looks at modern magic card design that we've gotten, and I've also seen a lot of people kind of engaging with it in bad faith or like reading weird things into it, which is why I wanted to kind of walk through it on the channel. Let's get into it. So, getting started on the Nadu situation, this has become a big topic in the community this week, so I wanted to add my thoughts to the discussion. My focus isn't on the banning, but on the behind-the-scenes processes that led to it. I'm head designer, so I wanted to focus on the design elements of the situation. This is already worth focusing on, or worth kind of pausing to underline. I've seen a handful of people kind of interacting with this blog article in a way that's like, I'm a modern player, and uh, the contents of this article conflict with what I would think is a good design product for producing modern cards. Or I'm a standard player, and etc, etc. Or I'm a, com a commander player, and even I have opinions on the stuff here. The, the point, or like, an intent with Mark in writing this article is very explicitly not to answer most of those questions. <laughs> Mark's focus in this article is talking about design and kind of risks and considerations and so on that impact and drive design work. So yeah, that, that alone I just really wanted to go, hey, th this is important. When we make magic, there are a few things we do to try and make it the best it can be. First we design in what we call an iterative loop. That is, we make something, we playtest it, we get feedback, we make changes on that feedback, and begin the next iteration of the loop. We try to get as many iterative loops in as we can before the set is locked, aka no more changes. No matter where we set that line, there's a last day to make changes. Moving that line earlier doesn't change anything other than giving us less iterative loops to improve things. Also, we make lots and lots of last-minute changes. The vast majority of them make the game better. I understand there's more focus on the times we make a mistake, but it represents a truly small percentage of changes. Let's again pause here for a second, because this is a somewhat important part of the article. We know of precisely two cards that have uh, been the result of a last-minute change in the design process and not subject to proper playtesting. Those cards are Nadu Winged Wisdom and Skull Clamp. Now, Magic produces something like 3,000 cards a year. I don't actually know the exact number offhand, but there's several mainline sets as well as, you know, Commander product, uh, just ever more of that. Um, so let's just say that a relatively small portion of those cards get last minute changes. One or two or maybe three percent, somewhere in that range. That alone already puts you in the ballpark of like 30 to 120 cards or so, and then from there you can just go like, okay, so two cards in the history of magic, uh, we multiply that by like 10 or whatever, and you get a kind of final number for the risk of doing a, a last minute change or something and it producing a skull clamp, a nadu. The way that kind of risk analysis works out is that it is like, 0.1% or whatever. I'm sure the way I've articulated that can be nitpicked or whatever. My point is not to give you exact numbers about, like, what's happening here, but more to articulate that I'm willing to accept Mark's claim at face value here. Uh, I, I would expect that even more than, you know, 1, 2, 3% um, of cards get last minute changes. The main thing I wish that this article had, or like the main strike against it for me, is it would be cool if Mark said, like, and here's an example of one or two or three cards that received a last minute change and it made them better. Also, before we get too far past it, uh, this iterative design loop process that Mark's talking about is pretty standard in design. Uh, there will often just be like rounds of playtesting and so on in development. So there's, like, nothing here is a particular red flag to me. Anyway, continuing. Also, whenever we design a card, we ask ourselves, who is this card for? If we're trying to make gameplay the best it can be, it helps to understand who will use the card, where they will use it, and what they will do with it. Obviously, in a game as modular as Magic, players can often zig when we expect them to zag. But in general, this process leads to the best design. There's a lot of stuff that you can kind of extrapolate from that paragraph alone. 
a kind of phrase that I want to emphasize or think about is the best oop, the best design. Um, so a, a thing that magic designers used to say 5, 10, 15 years ago, whatever, was that bad cards need to be in uh, products to teach players card evaluation effectively. Even if they're excited about a big Kraken or something, the vanilla 8-8 for 9 mana is not actually a good card. This is interesting to me partly because it represents a shift away from that design idea or that kind of methodology, which I think is good. <laughs> Basically, like, I, I think the idea that we need to put chaff and garbage cards in our product to, uh, I don't know, teach players nihilism is kind of weird and condescending, uh, just to be honest. So it, it's worth kind of flagging that there is this explicit internal shift away from that older methodology and towards this kind of utilitarian methodology, which is to say that we want every card to be useful for somebody. They won't all necessarily get to be useful in the same place, which we'll talk more about in a minute, but uh, we want every card to fulfill a function, to uh, make someone kind of reasonably excited or whatever, whether that's a limited, uh, limited player, a commander player, or so on. We have two play design teams, one focused on competitive play and one focused on casual play. The competitive play design teams determine which cards they think have a shot at competitive play. Remember, we're making predictions as where we think the environment might go. We definitely don't know. We need to make an environment complex enough that as to entertain tens of millions of players. The casual play design team then looks at the cards that don't play a competitive role to see what casual role they can play. Uh, so, yeah, let, let's again kind of just well, th think about this for a second. So this design methodology on its own is kind of interesting, or I think not how a lot of players would have communicated the feeling of like, oh, Commander is stealing card slots or utility or whatever from Standard. I know certainly in the past I would go like, Torrin's Fist of Angels, why is it a legendary? If it wasn't a legendary, it could be like a Monastery Mentor type card, and etc, etc, etc. And that's just because that's like, a kind of pain point or an obvious place to me as the consumer where I, I can kind of see this concession that was made for this format that I don't really play outside of like kind of indirectly through Brawl. But knowing that this function is in place, we can look for constructive examples or alternate examples of this thing in action. And something that I immediately thought of for I don't know why is Vat of Rebirth. It's a card that's not like efficient or not good enough to see play in standard. Its power is too kind of like windowed and constricted, but it's, you know, decent or reasonable in limited, which is one thing. And then in Commander, a format with Soul Ring and different mana accelerants and a long gate, uh, longer game times, higher resource throughput, etc., etc., etc. It can actually be a compelling kind of engine card, at least for budget like black or reanimation decks. And I think you can kind of run through like a thought experiment with a Vat of Rebirth going, okay, so what if Vat of Rebirth was a different cheap artifact? Something like Tormod's Crypt, which is not exciting, but it has this kind of nominal competitive utility. Maybe it would be a one or two of in sideboard slots, etc., etc. Is Standard much richer for having Tormod Script in it over Vat of Rebirth? I don't really think so. And then Vat of Rebirth is just gets to like have this life in other formats, or in Commander in particular, where it is this uh, kind of nice, cheap, budget friendly engine piece for. Uh, a certain type of deck, or like players who are doing a certain type of strategy. And it's hard for me to be mad at that in particular, or like I, I think that's an interesting example of um, the kind of argument from utility that Mark is putting forward here. Uh, like the cost of not having the Tormod's Crypt in Standard is effectively zero, it's close to nothing. And then they get to use the space in the card file for this thing that will go on to actually have value and produce interest and fun gameplay elsewhere. So yeah, um, anyway. With that said, let me respond to a few popular lines this week. STOP DESIGNING FOR COMMANDER! The nature of competitive formats is that only so many cards can be relevant. As you start making more competitive, relevant cards, they displace the weakest existing relevant cards. That's how a trading card game works. Let's pause here 
again, because I've seen people misunderstand this too, or, um, yeah. So Mark is not saying that all cards are interchangeable, that there is no point to banning a card because a new, the next most powerful card will simply become the next most bannable card and etc, etc, etc. Uh, what Mark is saying here is that competitive play performs an optimization function on any given set of cards. If card A has a 51% win rate and card B has a 50.9% win rate, it will always be the correct decision for a competitive player to pick card A. There is zero reason at all to pick card B unless there are complicating factors like matchup against the field, personal comfort, playing card B, or etc. And the same thing applies to decks. Uh, there can be a teeny tiny fractional reason to pick a slightly more competitive deck, and a competitive player should always pick that deck. This optimization function is pretty tough on card design. It's going to necessarily mean that a lot of cards do not see play. Even just entirely ignoring the aspects of card design that make doing it difficult, which is to say it's really hard to look, guess what standard will look like in a year, um, ignoring all that, there's kind of like a black box optimization function you can do on the design labor that goes into a magic set, which is to say, you know for sure that the most competitive card, or like the most pushed card you design that will for sure see play, uh, you know all your time spent on that card is going to be effective and useful and good. And then as soon as you uh, design a second card for competitive, are you sure that it can ha hang with card one? Like, the, the confidence as to whether or not the labor spent on, like, tinkering with and refining that card, it goes down just a little bit. And then for card three, well, uh, so it, it's also very good and strong and powerful, but can it hang with card one and card two? Uh, and, and you have this kind of degradation of confidence in terms of, uh, the expected utility and value of design labor spent working on that card. And for the top, say, 100 cards or even 200 cards in a set or whatever, that might be okay. You might just say, like, yeah, we want to for sure try to dedicate this number of cards of card slots to standard. But by the time you get to designing the last bits of a set of magic, or like some random two-drop common, it becomes much, much harder to effectively place it in any kind of competitive context. You're just doing like guesswork and stuff effectively at that point. Anyway, moving on. That means that not every card in the set, or even just the rares and mythic rares, as the commons and uncommons have a big role in making the limited environment work, has a competitive role. As such, we examine how they will play in more casual settings. There's no reason not to do that. And when you think of casual settings, you are remiss if you don't consider Commander. It's the 800-pound gorilla of tabletop play, aka the most-played, heavily dominant format. Us considering the casual ramifications of a card that we didn't feel was competitively viable is not what broke the card. Us missing the interaction with a component of the game we consider broken and have stopped doing, zero cost activations, but still lives on in older formats is the cause. So this section is very much Mark going, okay, so you know that kind of decaying confidence we have in cards and whether or not they can even be competitive? Well... There is minimal cost to pointing those cards elsewhere, and trying to think of like, okay, if they can't do this one thing, why can't they do this other thing? And I think that that is a, like, actually pretty reasonable way to approach designing cards. In general, uh, I, I'm certainly someone who wants, like, standard cards in standard, but I can also appreciate the utility of, like, pointing the lower end of a card design file or whatever elsewhere and going, hey, um, we're a trash tactician or something, maybe it will be okay in standard, but uh, we're going to, you know, tinker with some knobs on this so that it is a little bit more exciting in Commander or whatever. And it's worth maybe kind of like slowing down here and really underlying a kind of key thing, which is to say, things being designed for casual play does not mean that they won't see competitive play. 
Um, just like Nadu is the thing that this article is about, is a case in point of that. Nadu uh, was seen as a casual card, and despite that, it made an entire deck and was this big competitive role player, so much so that it needed to be banned. Hogak is another example we have of this thing that was kind of intended for casual play, but oh no, oh, it's wild and broken and modern, and so on. Um, and it's really tempting to look at that top end and to go like, designing for casual play is no good, Mwah, shake fist, etc, etc. But also, we don't know what cards that were designed for casual see competitive play currently. We don't necessarily have that explicit, like, information about the card design that's happening. As an example, I think you could reasonably say that Shieldred was designed to be a commander card. And uh, just because of like how it interacts with upkeeps and m in a multiplayer format and so on, um, I think it's healthier there, even if, if it's not like terribly fun or whatever. In frankly, any format, like I don't like that card, but I could see it being designed for casual play. And then, despite that, it gets to be this thing that lives in competitive formats and is like standard competitive, and that's kind of fine. Again, I don't like it, but, you know, I'm not the arbiter of what is good and cool and standard. It just gets to be this thing that's a role player. So sorry, I've gotten a little bit rambly because this is like the main meat of the article for me or the main thing that I find interesting. Mark is not really placing a value judgment here on designing for competitive or designing for casual or the exact specifics of like how a meta shakes out or why a card is broken or whatever. The thing that Mark is trying to articulate is that there are design considerations that affect how labor is allocated and the return on investment for that labor allocation. Which I think is neat or interesting, like, a really broad heuristic that I know some players will have for magic cards is like, if it's on three mana or less, it's for competitive, and if it's four mana or higher, it's uh, for casual, and this is a kind of paragraph of this article that says like, no, that's that's not how magic cards are designed now. Cards will be specifically marked for uh, like casual or competitive play because that they feel that produces more effective, higher utility, more fun designs. And I don't know, I just think that's interesting. Like there is a real argument for utility here for Mark, uh, this, this kind of like utilitarian, we just want to make the most people happy thing. And I've already seen people kind of undercutting this idea that Mark is proposing is like, oh, this is just conceding to shareholders and Watsy greed. <laughs> And I think that's kind of, I don't know, disingenuous or whatever, like I'm one of the first people to rally the Watsy Greed Saber when it's relevant or happening. I think that's why I don't get invited to early access events anymore. But um, uh, in this case, Mark is just like, no, I, w I want to make a game that, you know, makes the largest number of people happy. And there is a way to do that or kind of improve how we do that that, that doesn't actually cost competitive formats that much. And I think you can kind of like nitpick and go like, no, they're conceding too much ground to Commander or whatever in standard sets, in a modern set, in uh, etc. But without knowing the exact specifics of like how cards are marked as casual or competitive and when that happens and yada yada yada, I don't think that that's like a super productive or interesting angle to approach at least this article from. Anyway, kind of moving on. Stop making late changes. Whenever you see an airplane on the news, something bad has happened. It crashed or caught fire or had an emergency landing or a door fell off. Why do we still make planes? Because planes are pretty useful and what's being highlighted is the worst element. That focus can lead people to false assumptions. Magic would not be better if we stopped making last minute changes. A lot more broken things would get through, things we caught and changed, and many more cards just wouldn't be playable. Our process of fixing things up to the last minute does lots and lots of good. Maybe it doesn't get the focus of the screw-ups, but it leads to better design." Um, so Mark is kind of talking about two things here, or like one is just a kind of reporting function, like um, if you're doing a good job, people shouldn't know that you've done a job at all. There's lots of cards that are kind of below the radar of popular attention. Uh, the other element, or like an interesting thing here for me, is that just Mark is saying that there is a very high utility in making a last minute change, and this might seem weird to people who are not 
designers or like I, I'm sure I'm absolutely 100% sure that there will be loads of takes focusing on this element going like they don't even play their own game and it's just like wow how's that armchair treating you uh, now sorry more productively or more constructively uh, as a designer, there is utility in playtesting feedback. One of the main things that you will run into as a person who designed games is like, or advice from other designers will be like, you should playtest early and playtest often. That will have all, like, do all these things to help improve your product and make it better. Like, just full stop. And uh, to a certain extent, that is very true. But there are also limits to playtesting. Playtesting takes effort and money and stuff, and it has logistical hurdles. Uh, like, just paying playtesters is a thing that matters, um, or like a thing that can add up. And you can go like, well, Watsi so should pay uh, for more playtesters and stuff. That would simply solve the problem. And it's like, no, actually, there are diminishing returns on playtesting in general. Early playtesting will tend to be really productive or like produce a lot of elements that can, uh, a, a lot of like friction points or whatever that designers can look at and go like, oh, we should fix this, that, and the other thing. And then you playtest again, and that reveals some new elements or whatever, but maybe not quite as many. And by the, you know, tenth time they get through the iterative loop or whatever, uh, there's not actually that much stuff that's appearing in playtesting, because playtesters will not catch everything. Uh, let's walk through a specific kind of thought experiment of the limited utility of playtesting. Um, let's say that playtesters actually do get to see the version of Nadu with the final templating and the kind of worrying concerns about zero cost abilities and yada yada yada. And let's say that a playtester goes like, question, lightning greaves exist. What do? Is, is that a thing that we're worried about? Um, that does not necessarily mean that at that step in the process that someone would go like, oh yeah, this is a huge thing that's going to ruin modern. Uh, we should absolutely immediately redo the entirety of Nadu. Like, uh, in, in the on banning Nadu article, Nadu's designer, Michael Majors, says, yeah, it, it, at this point, or like with hindsight, small fixes are not appropriate. I would have just re entirely redone the text box and stuff. But in playtesting, you might not necessarily have the benefit of that hindsight and might just go, now let's make Nadu a 3-3 three, three that costs 4 mana or something. Like, surely that's safer, right? Like, we've identified this, um, we've identified this potential issue and we've made changes to address it, and we have been done good design work, right? Uh, I think, or I think, like, Michael Majors might say that, uh, or articulates in here that no, a, a fix like changing Nadu's toughness or something would not be appropriate. If you make Nadu cost, he doesn't say this in the article, but if you make Nadu cost one more mana, maybe the Nadu decks in modern just have to run like a Utopia sprawl or something. Like, th there's a lot of complexities that mean that even if something is identified in playtesting, it's not necessarily going to receive the appropriate fix. So the kind of interesting or compelling thing about this point to me is that Mark is a big believer in a designer's kind of creative uh, control, or creative control might not be the best phrasing, but the ability of a designer to bypass playtesting or to make kind of executive decisions that better serve the game as a whole, to go kind of like, no, I know how this stuff functions in general, um, I, changing toughness, not appropriate, changing the mana cost, uh, 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 uh. We're going to take it right back to the drawing board, uh, take it to the drawing board and massively change a design, like what happened to Nadu in the first place, or like what caused this issue. But yeah, it's kind of generally interesting or compelling to me as like an amateur designer that Mark is kind of willing to take the risk and eat the losses with this kind of step of the design process, that he's a big believer in the executive decision making of a designer to identify like ways to make designs better, ways to rein in problem issues, etc. It's way less interesting to me to kind of approach this with a dogmatic view of like, playtesting is truly and purely good and necessary and so on, and way more compelling to look at this as like, these are some very clever people uh, who are making decisions to best do a thing, to best deliver this product, best design cards, etc. And this is the solution that they came up with. I am a Dumbo. 
what can we learn from looking at these clever people's solution or the fix? Even if you don't agree with like my evaluation of what's happening here or like what they are doing in the design process, I think it is way more enriching to treat it as like a, a good faith or a thing that they're doing as, you know, working professionals who are aware of the, what their job is, basically. Anyway, continuing on, everything needs to get playtested. My and my team's job is to take a blank piece of paper and make something that doesn't exist, exist. That's not an easy thing to do. I believe play design's job is even harder. They're trying to make a balanced environment with thousands of moving pieces a year in the future. And if we're able to solve it on our end, that means the player base will crack it in a minute one with playing with it. A minute, by the way, is the time it takes the magic player base to play with the set as much as we can. There are tens of millions of you, and a handful of us. There simply isn't time in the day to test everything, so the play design team tests what they think has the highest chance of mattering. They take calculated gambles based on years of experience, and test the things most likely to cause problems. Will things slip through? There's no way they can't. The system is too complex to not miss things. That doesn't mean that we don't continually improve our process to lower the chances of mistakes, but w nothing we're going to do can completely eliminate them. This factor alone is one of the reasons why I have like very little patience for the uh, armchair commentators going like, no, simply do more playtesting or whatever. Um, just because like, okay, y you don't think that magic designers are doing a good job or whatever, you think you could do better? Sure, let's just say that that's true. Let's say that you are the golden god of magic. You have an encyclopedic knowledge of every single card ever printed, etc., etc., etc. Do you think that you are better than, you know, the tens of millions of people playing magic? That is a taller order. <laughs> yeah, anyway. Designing magic is difficult. Next year is my 30th year working on the game, and I think we have the most talented team we've ever had. Plus, as we iterate on the designs in the set, we iterate on the design processes of making magic. How we make magic today is light years different and, I believe, better than how we made magic when I started. If I have seen further, it's because I stand on the shoulders of giants. One final thing. I've always pushed for transparency in magic design. No one on the planet has written slash spoken about it more than me. I truly believe magic is better as a game because its players have the insight to understand what we, the people making it, are doing. We do ask for one thing in exchange. Please treat the designers who take the time to share with you the behind-the-scenes workings of magic design with kindness. We are all human beings with feelings. There's nothing wrong with feedback, but it can be delivered with common courtesy. Um, yeah, I did want to read that too, or focus on that, because uh, I, overall I think this article is doing two things. Mark is, I think, or like as my interpretation here, talking about just a really fundamental kind of labor allocation of design thing with this article. That That's the one intent of this, and the other is to try and, I assume, alleviate some of the harassment that they are very likely receiving from uh, Nadu, existing and awkward band timings and so on. And yeah, I'm, I'm not a person who generally likes to deploy the rhetorical maneuver of, it's a children's card game, care less about it, ho <laughs> ho. Just because I think that that is not kind of accurate to most people's relationship with magic, it doesn't kind of treat it with the respect and so on that leads to people devoting their lives to this game, uh, th this thing that can enrich people's lives and, uh, you know, do X, Y, and Z for the community. Um, but I do think that that is a good thing to keep in mind when thinking about, like, getting mad about a card game. Because, <laughs> like, the intent of the company, or certainly the intent of the designers, or whatever, is uh, this thing I've been talking about throughout this entire article of, like, trying to maximize utility for utility and, in turn, happiness for the ho largest number of people. Like, these are people just purely working to spark joy, to make the world a better place. Getting mad at that is wild. Like... Are, are you okay? Do you need help? Uh, j just, you know, theoretical person who's harassing designers because a card made them, made you 
this the this theoretical person angry anyway yeah sorry this video's gone on for way too long i just thought it was a really interesting article or like a really insightful article in terms of modern magic design and i've seen a lot of people already kind of misconstruing the information presented here or i feel misconstruing the information presented here Hopefully you maybe help feel like this was helpful. The, the, if the video good, like, subscribe, etc. Thanks. Uh, dig around in the description for links to Patreon, Twitch, the Discord. Um, if you're buying magic cards, consider using the card trader link and my code because that helps the channel a lot. And yeah, thank you again for watching. Have a wonderful day. Bye bye. Thank you for watching the video, and an extra big thank you to the Patreon patrons and YouTube members that help make these videos possible. Hope you have a wonderful day. Bye bye